This is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing? I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Michael D. A. Baker teaches financial literacy. He has an MBA in finance. In fact, he has dedicated his entire life to helping people figure out their finances. And he's condensed everything he's learned into a book he says will change your life. It is entitled, Life Can't Throw a Fastball, A Guide to Personal Finance. I started writing the book before the pandemic, but when the pandemic hit and I saw all the people that lost their jobs, this book is really written for somebody who's living paycheck to paycheck, and now there's millions more of those people. So I picked up the pace of the book and finished it so we could get it out there. It's very inexpensive. I also changed the entire scope of the book. Instead of a 420-page book, I narrowed it down to 80 pages. So you don't have to read a lot to get a lot. Instead of reading a chapter and getting one ideas per chapter, you've got one or two ideas per page. So that was an entire different way of read a little bit, get help on what you need. That's the whole concept behind it. People aren't taught about financial literacy in high school or college, and therefore you learn by the school of hard knocks. You make the mistake and then you have to learn from it. The Chinese have an old expression that a stupid person makes the same mistake over and over again. A smart person learns from their mistakes, but a truly wise person learns from other people's mistakes. In other words, they don't have to physically make the mistake to learn from it. If we can, if I can teach you about financial literacy, you can not have to make the mistake to learn from it, and this should hopefully save you thousands of dollars. The title of the book is Life Can't Throw a Fastball because all you seem to get in life is curveballs. There's going to be a curveball, like you get a flat tire or you get a parking ticket or your air conditioner stops working. And what do people do since they don't have a savings account? They throw it on the credit card. Would you believe 1% of the people pay off the credit card in full? The other 99% are now paying interest on the balance until they pay that card off, which could be a long time down the road. So the first step is getting you a savings account. So when something unexpected happens, you use that emergency fund of a couple hundred dollars and you don't throw it on the plastic and you don't start incurring interest. From there, I get you a budget. I save you on your cars. I save you on your mortgage. Every single thing that you do in your life, I have ways in this book to save you money so that you end up being ahead of the game. Then without changing your budget, I can take a 30-year mortgage and I have two ways in the book where you can pay it off in 15 and your budget didn't change. An average person gets paid every two weeks, 24 paychecks. Two a month for 12 months is 24 paychecks. But there's 52 weeks in a year. You get paid 26 times a year. And I'm taking those extra paychecks two months a year. You're going to get a third paycheck. I'm taking half of it. And one method, you make a half a mortgage payment and a half a mortgage payment, which is 13 mortgage payments in a year instead of 12. The other way I'm taking the money, and I'm not using all of it. You could still got to live those two weeks. I'm using the money and I'm applying it towards the principal of the mortgage because all of the interest is heavily upfront loaded. You can knock out the principal on the back end very easily. Those two methods are both laid out in the book. And there's a lot of super simple things. For example, if you get your credit card statement, instead of paying just the minimum due, you pay $10 over the minimum. 100% of that $10 will all go towards the principal. Most of what you paid on the minimum due is paying off on the interest. So you'll end up paying the credit card off twice as fast and saving probably $500 or more in interest just by paying $10 over the minimum on all your cards. I'm going to teach you how to get out of debt. I'm going to create a financial snowball. So we're going to go after the smallest bill. We're going to get it paid off. We're going to use that money 
onto the next bill and we're going to create a financial snowball and you will have the whole debt paid off in less time than you ever dreamed possible and we never changed your budget. We simply used the money from the first bill and poured it onto the second one. We got the second one. Now we got three payments onto the third one and it, the snowball just keeps growing. And the only other thing is I'm getting you to use a debit card. So while we're doing this, you are not incurring any more debt. Yeah, the debit card definitely helps. But here's the thing. There's people out there like Dave Ramsey and there's, you know, there's a million people out there that are telling you how they're going to save you this, that and the other thing. You know, how do you make your book stand out? You read anybody else's book, you read 20 pages you get one or two ideas. I've combined 420 pages into 80. So you're getting one to two ideas per page as opposed to, gee, I read a 400 page book and I got 10 chapters. I got 20 ideas in my book. There should be 160 ideas in 80 pages, if not more. That's one way I make it stand out. Everything is jammed in there. There isn't any fluff at all. This is all meat. Another thing that I've done, which I want people to know, is for every book that I sell, I give an ebook away for free so I can help as many people as possible. My website is www.lifecan'tthrowafastball.com. It's right in there. Every single book that I sell, I give an ebook away for free because we really are trying to help as many people as possible with this book. Well, thanks for that, Michael. We appreciate that. Simon Peter Broughton was born across the pond and landed in Belvedere, Illinois. He was a line operator at General Mills, a preacher, and now he's an author who's written a thriller entitled Don't Go Chasing After Waterfalls, The Clues Right Under Your Nose. About three years ago in February, we had a real heavy snowstorm here, ice snow storm. It was 24 inches deep, and I had called off work so I could shovel out my driveway and my two neighbors driveway either side of me and in the afternoon um, I was studying for teaching a class and the song from TLC came on the radio that um, said don't go chasing waterfalls and so my family and my friends at the coffee club have always wanted me to write a book but they thought I would write a theological book or a history book or a political book and I told my wife that day, I'm going to write a murder mystery set in Victorian times. I'm going to write a series about mind games. So that's what inspired about mind games. That will have more on spiritual lessons within it. Yeah. Daisy McGee is the first of her kind, a woman who has become a chief inspector. She has to deal with people getting murdered. And the women are laid out at different types of waterfalls. And part of the, the mystery is, is that there are nursery rhymes and riddles and that each murderer has a different color scheme and there's flowers that are that match the color scheme and then each uh, young lady has a nose stud in the left side of her nose and it has a clue to the next waterfall in in a code that they have to solve and um, the killer or killers going to never reveal in any of my books what they are in this book they they send um uh, letters to uh, Daisy McGee in a cat and mouse game. And um, so these letters are also clues as to um, uh, full of riddles that they have to um, they have to solve. And then also there are cutouts sent um, that are left in folded clothes. And in the letters that are sent, there are little cutouts that string along from each murder and they are clues to the nursery rhymes. Wow, a lot of layers there. Yeah, there are quite a lot of little, little layers within the book. It will be in series. There will be different stories, different you know things to them, but it's a, it's a series on how people play mind games. And within the book, with some of the characters, Daisy McGee belongs to the Church of Christ. So there are, and, and I have a preacher in, in there whose name is Bedford Eggington Davies, and in the first book, he when he's preaching and teaching, he's giving clues, which he doesn't know, but he's giving clues to stimulate Daisy's mind thinking on um, solving the, the murders. 
Nice. Where people can contact me is um, lionheartauthorship at gmail.com. Um, I've talked to the radio and news stations locally for them to read my book and then interview me. I've also shared it mouth to mouth at gatherings and um, places that I've been, and there seems to be a lot of interest from people. Uh, the three main libraries, actually, I go to, they've all said that they will do book signings. I just got a book, and it's about how to market your work. And I've seen that there are things like blogging and stuff like that. So I'm going to be looking into that. Well, hey, I did want to say that um, because of what my family have said, you know, creativity, everybody has creativity. And it doesn't matter how old you are, you can still live your dreams using the creativity that you, that you have been given. Thanks, Simon. I needed that. Oh, thank you. Elaine Osborne lives in Esco, Minnesota, where her once robust and healthy life was turned upside down as a result of a series of chemical spills near her home. She details how those responsible failed to take action, left her disabled, and suffering environmental illnesses for the rest of her life. In her book, If I Felt Alone. We had five major sewage breaks by a 42-inch pipeline, which they call a force main, that was under pressure and it broke. Several times it went out in a geyser-like area. At that time I was working and I did not know what was going on. And after some time I found out that they had trouble with that line that I didn't know existed in the area. They put patch up jobs, like putting the band-aid on the pipe. The line was built in the late 70s. And it had problems because they amended it by changing the original specifications from a ductile iron to concrete. And this toxic chemical waste spewed out all over and they would just patch the pipe and do nothing more until they were forced by myself to take action. Well, I mean, you said toxic materials from hospitals, mortuaries, dry cleaners, the worst, printers. I mean, people got sick, right? Not so many, not to the extent of getting disabled like I did. And and there are reasons for that. This is basically paper mill wastewater, which is pure chemicals. And they only talk to me about bacterial contamination. I had trouble with my drinking water and quit drinking it entirely in 1985 and have been carrying in my water ever since. Why I found out that I got so sick is that I, I'm the closest home to the spill area. They had the breaks all in one under a 500 foot area. And I have a neurological problem too from the spill. So it's hard for me to uh, lose track of where I'm at sometimes. So I didn't realize until 1989 that I was getting sick from my water. I noticed that the trees, these huge, majestic-looking pine trees, were dying on my property. I would vomit. I would lose my sense of balance. I would have vertigo and numerous other symptoms. But as the years went on, it grew that my mouth felt like a huge faucet extended to the fullest and profusely even arced vomit spewed out and at that time I was working in a nursing home and I said to one of the nurses and she said your body is trying to tell you that it has something that it needs to get rid of so a full 10 years later I ran into a lady in Duluth 
who was in a fabric store, and I had a mask on, and I said, because I'm having trouble with the smells in here, she said, you must be chemically sensitive, and she said she was, and she said, I go down to see a doctor in La Crosse, Wisconsin, 265 miles away, and she said, a Dr. Croker, George Croker, and she said she felt that he could help me. And he is he saved my life because I was already going into uh, end organ failure with the brain and my liver. And nobody could figure that out. Nobody. My doctor, she had put in in my medical records, really needs to get hold of herself because I was having momentary blackouts even. And the treatment I got from the medical field, from everybody, including my family, was that I needed psychiatric help. We went to court in 1996 because they weren't doing anything about the pipeline. They were not doing anything to help me. And so I needed to make them responsible and stand up for that pipeline and fix it. And that's when they really got forced into replacing the pipeline by Minnesota Pollution Control and the state, and I think federal was involved too. It was a faulty line. So did you end up getting anything out of it? No, no, I did not. The judge was going to throw my case out of court. (laughs) My inability to testify on the stand Because of my illness, he used against me as if I didn't have a case. But he gave the attorneys the opportunity to work out something. And they settled for either $36,000 or $39,000 for destroying my life. And that money went into the hands of my attorney You know, and I got nothing. I got nothing. And my main reason for writing the book is that they had put me through so much and I I wanted to get my story out there, you know, to alert other people that might be having some of these symptoms that there's a reason for it. Well, thank you for that, Elaine, and I I hope that you are somehow able to enjoy the rest of your life. Something to think about as we take a short break. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Attention all authors. Page Publishing is looking for authors. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, Apple iTunes, and other outlets. They handle all aspects of the publishing process for you. Printing, cover art, publicity, copyright, and editing. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. That's 800-204-6099 for your free author submission kit. We're back on the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Thomas Corrin recently got a degree in music composition, and along the way, he took a course during which, through extensive research, he developed a trilogy that begins in Atlantic City when casinos were illegal and the mob ruled the seaside resort. The name of his book, East Coast Even Tide. Well, the whole idea for the story um, started back in 2014. Uh, I was taking a creative writing class, and uh, there was this project where we had to create a character out of nowhere, um, almost like molding a lump of clay, if you will. We were supposed to start off really abstract and then continue to develop details and give the character a physical description and a personality and a name and so forth. Um, So that was how the character of Nicholas Malone came about. Then we were required to keep a weekly writing journal for the class. So I continued to keep working on different sections of the story week after week. And uh, then before I knew it, uh, I had a draft for what had later become chapters uh, 5 through 14 of the story. Uh, And then I just kept refining things from there. A completely fictionalized story set back in 1962, over a decade before I was born. Uh, But what I decided to do. 
throughout the development of the story is go back to a bygone era. So um, I tried to get inspired by looking back at the classic noir uh, mysteries and detective stories as far back as, you know, the 30s and 40s. So I read a lot of older books and watched some of my favorite classic movies and played a lot of older video games to get an idea of what to do and what not to do. So as a writer, you you really want to try to study everything that you like to get inspiration and um, try to take things in a little bit different direction than uh, what they had been previously done. Uh, so you find yourself honing your skills along the way as a writer. I, you, you know, you're making me want to take a creative writing class right now. Oh, <laughs> thank you. It starts off with a guy in his early 20s. Um, he's working as a real estate agent, and he's been involved with a woman that he's known for uh, quite some time now and decides that he wants to propose to her. Um, so he, after he gets done meeting with a client, uh, walks out into the rain and hails a cab and uh, goes to a jewelry store to try to buy an engagement ring. And then the jewelry store gets robbed while he's still in there. And he ends up escaping. He ends up calling his father, who is you know a bit more powerful and organized crime, and um, explains what had happened. Says, okay, I need your help. So from there, Frank Moniardi and Nicholas Malone being old rivals through the underground gambling circuit really didn't get along before then but they kind of put their personal differences aside to handle this new problem because it's something that potentially could pose a threat to both of them so the new problem that arrives the character's name is vincent plummer goya and he ends up coming over to new jersey from new york and ends up raising a, a bit of a, a ruckus all the way around. So to really try to create the, the villainous character of, of Vincent Plumagoy, he's considerably younger and uh, a bit more arrogant than um, the characters of Frank Moniardi and Nicholas Malone. Um, so I tried to put everything that I kind of considered dislikable in, in our society and into the character of Vincent Plumagoy. And I wanted to create a bad guy that seemed to personify um, how bad a person could be. And uh, someone who had no respect for anybody else on the planet and tries to get their own way right away. And um, somebody that you're thankful as a reader to see them have um, an attack of conscience or a, a moment of clarity by the end of the story. So what I'm thinking is um, the first story takes place in 1962. The second story would be set somewhere around the mid 70s and then have the third story be in the mid to late 1980s. So um, culturally, the reader will be able to get a um, good sense of advancements as far as what has changed culturally in our society, what may have even changed as far as technological advancements. So really giving uh, the reader a sense of momentum forward um, and then almost, you know, getting the reader to think, well, OK, here we are in the year 2021. Um, what's life going to be like for us when it turns to be 2030 or 2040 or 2050? Um, getting them as far as um, sparking their imagination, if, if they were to write a story that takes place in the future, what ideas could they use or how could they dream about our world becoming a better place as time continues to move on? Interesting stuff, Thomas. Thank you. Mac Rose is a day trader in stocks and cryptos, and he only got into writing because someone told him he'd be good at it. So he got to work on a book of poetry. It's entitled Passion in its Finest Fashion. Honestly, I was just writing and then I was like, OK, this is something. I didn't really know what I was writing. And I just I just put it into poetry format, and then I just oh okay I guess this is poetry you know that's how I came up with passion in its finest fashion like basically love lust relationships you know it's like a feeling you can relate to it's based off of my experiences with past girlfriends it's just flings you know how I felt about those things you know it's just something anybody can relate to really because we've all felt these things right we just really never knew how to put it into words and what I did was I just put it into words on paper. And uh, that's how I manifested it. Like poetry was never really my thing. 
But then, you know, I just realized I had a talent for writing, so this is why I've done this. Uh, so how do you know your poetry's good? Oh, okay. That's a fair question. I've had, like, uh, friends and pals, whatever the case was. So really, I didn't, I honestly, I really didn't know. I mean, it sounds good to me when I read it, right? So I agree with you. I had that question, too. So, you know, I started, like, uh, giving it to dudes, like, letting them read it, whatever the case was, or people, not just dudes, but, you know, women, too, whatever. So I've had, like, women, like, women readers who are into poetry. I've had, like, friends who have girlfriends read it, and, like, and I, and I actually, I had them thought that, well, I didn't have them thought, but they would make it seem like it came from them, and they would tell me, like, their girlfriends or their significant other's reaction. And it, like, I've heard things about their girl crying, depending on which one it was, you know, stuff like that, or, like, them being so, like, ecstatic about, like, carrying it and reading it. You know, I've just had females who was just, they were just, like, breath, uh, like breathtakingly, like, they, they loved it. That's how I know. I mean, yeah, so it wasn't like just, I just wrote a book. I, I, I just, I went through a lot of people and I've even had friends like, yo, these are some, these are vows I've given my wife. And I was like, okay. Oh my God, it's nice. like, how about this one? How about this one? You know, just the multiple different people just to get their take on it. So it's, it's all really, it's all been positive reviews for me. So I'm like, okay, maybe I, I could do something with this. I could, I could make a book out. And so that's what I did because I had, I just, I just ended up writing so many of them. So I'm like, well, all right, I guess I might as well make it a, make it a book, you know? So how many poems are in the book? I know, I don't know the exact number. I counted it one time a little while ago, but I believe there's like 60 something poems in the book. That's a lot of poems. Is there anything you can, is there anything short you can read? Yes, I do have something I can read. I'll read the first poem in the book. It's called A Sleep by Dream, A uh, Lucid Desire, I'm Chasing a Lovely Flame. Oh, so unobtainable, she intoxicates my brain. I wake, and it's a dark day. My heart aches with anger that can cause an earthquake. A beauty that can't be described, no words to prescribe. Gorgeous doesn't cut it. Yeah, I wish to indulge myself in your glory. The desire in my heart sparks erotic thoughts. Dark and die in my need, my want. You are my ultimate inhibition, my mission. An angel so graceful, I'm thankful. On my knees, I bleed. I repent to your sins, I will plead. I want to see you on your knees to the 90 degree with an arch to please me. It can be nice when I put it down. Mm. I'm sure, though, you will enjoy the whole thing. I'm not, I'm just a man in romance, addicted to a queen. So let's just embrace the moment as I make you my ex queen. It sounds like a song. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's like the rhythm I have in it. All right, Matt, great start, and we're out of time. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Download the podcast at 710WOR.com. I'm Alice Stockton-Rossini. Catch you next time.